Um, clearly overdressed for this crowd. <laughs> yeah, I, I was at Parkland this morning and the doctors, they still wear ties. So uh, Non-Invasics, uh, we're a health wildcatters company. I'm Graham Randall, I'm the CEO of Non-Invasics. <laughs> if you have children, and I'm sure, well, I mean, that's applaudable in itself, uh, then I'm sure this is a familiar sight to you. The fetal heart rate monitor, which is the band that's wrapped around the mother's belly, is a 40-year-old technology that is still essentially the only tool that obstetricians have to assess fetal well-being during labor. What they don't tell you when you're in the labor and delivery room, however, is that it has an 89% false positive rate. Nine times out of 10, when the obstetrician orders an emergency C-section, he or she pulls out a healthy pink baby. Nine times out of 10. Now, this doesn't seem like a big deal, right? Better safe than sorry, but this adds up to over $5 billion in unnecessary health care costs, and it's not without maternal risk. Over 100 new mothers will lose their life in an unnecessary procedure. So why is this? Well, OBs order emergency C-sections when they're worried about fetal well-being. Specifically, they're worried about the amount of oxygen that's getting to the baby's brain. Brain hypoxia is the cause of 23% of neonatal mortality. That's second only to prematurity. 31% of the survivors face severe and lifelong disability, including uh, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, and mental retardation. And it's the ninth most expensive hospital condition, adding up to over $28,000 uh, in hospital costs and requiring 16 days in the NICU. So if OBs are concerned about fetal well-being, why don't they have a tool, if they're worried about brain oxygenation, why don't they have a tool to directly measure the oxygenation of the baby's brain? Non-Invasics has developed a new technology called Optoacoustics, which is going to revolutionize obstetrics by allowing OBs to directly, accurately, and non-invasively measure the oxygenation of the baby's brain during labor. The concept is simple. It works like a stethoscope. The OB holds the, the probe between his fingers. He inserts it transvaginally during labor. Uh, that's when the guidelines say that OBs should order emergency C-sections, and he or she can take a reading right off the top of the baby's head. Technology has been developed with over $6 million in DOD and NIH grant funding at UTMB down in Galveston. It's protected by six issued patents, and we have uh, six patents uh, pending. Uh, we've proven it in animal and human testing, including in the labor and delivery room. And, of course, we have the exclusive worldwide license from UTMB. So tissue oximetry is ubiquitous in the hospital today. You go to your, your, uh, your general practitioner, he straps on a blood pressure cuff, and then he puts on a, a pulse ox uh, clip onto your finger. Uh, we, uh, we have a better pulse ox. Just our market estimates for just the areas where pulse oximetry is deficient, say this is a $5 billion, nearly a $5 billion market in the United States and nearly $12 billion worldwide. We're starting in pediatrics in labor and delivery in the NICU because there's really no competition at all in that space. Then we're expanding out into adult cerebral oximetry, tra tra uh, traumatic brain injury uh, operations, uh, cardiovascular surgeries. Uh, then we can go into central venous oximetry. We could actually monitor the oxygenation of the central vein. This would allow us to diagnose shock, shock and sepsis. And the largest market opportunity is actually total hemoglobin monitoring. The total hemoglobin blood test is the most commonly ordered blood test today. We can do it non-invasively and continuously. We think this has the potential to be the next vital sign. Our team is experienced. Non-invasics is the third company I've run as CEO. I have a PhD in molecular biophysics from Baylor College of Medicine. I have an MBA from Rice. Uh, our founders and our inventors, Dr. Pro and Dr. Senelev, are both professors at UTMB. Dr. Pro is uh, the chair of anesthesiology. He actually used to be the dean of medicine. Where are we today? We've raised $2 million in seed funding. We've developed three generations of clinical prototypes, which we've tested in animals, adults, and fetuses and neonates. We've submitted our 510K pre-sub and actually found it to the FDA, and I found out this week that they've already scheduled our next meeting on the 18th. That's less than a month between our submission and our uh, uh, next meeting. And we have issued IP and we're aggressively uh, protecting our portfolio. Where are we going? We're currently raising a $3.75 million Series A, which would allow us to build the manufacturing prototype, which we will take to the FDA for clinical trials and 510K clearance, and uh, uh, then uh, and eventually to launch. Our exit, 
Uh, well, you can read. Three point seven five million. Well, you know that's a. I get sort of a. There's a dichotomy between what I would deal with on the coast and what I have experienced in Houston and in Texas. Uh, yeah, when I talk to uh, to West Coast VCs, they're like, "Well, let's just talk about the eight million. What do you need to get to the market?" When I talk uh, to to folks elsewhere, like in Texas, eight million is a little large, and so I've been talking about three point seven five. So it's either you know eight million tranched or you know eight million. Well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Next. Um, what, what kind of FDA approval do you need? So we are uh, proposing a de novo 510K. So there's really no technology uh, that we could use as a predicate. But we, uh, the technology has always been treated as a uh, non-significant risk device when we've done IRB approved studies. Oh, like malpractice? Yeah. You, know, uh, you know, malpractice is actually one of the reasons we got into this space is because uh, you know, malpractice and obstetrics, uh, obstetricians have paid more malpractice claims than anybody else. And uh, the, the way reimbursement is changing in, in, uh, in obstetrics is there's increasing cost pressures to reduce the C-section rate. At the same time, their malpractice risk has not decreased. And so there's uh, increased market pain we see for a tool that will allow them to make better decisions about C-section. Right, and, and when cost is not an issue, that, that has worked, and that's why we had a doubling of the C-section rate throughout the 2000s. And now uh, we're seeing, last year, the Joint Commission started requiring hospitals to report their C-section rates. This year we're seeing third-party payers start, re, uh, start changing their po reimbursement policies. So we're seeing bundled payments, in which case they're saying, we're gonna reimburse a birth. Whether it's a C-section or a vaginal birth, you're getting one payment. And so, and if, you, uh, if your C-section rate is too high, then you don't make as much money. And that's what's going to drive the, uh, the reduction in C-section rate. So um, one of the numbers I thought was really interesting was the 9 out of 10 false positives. And you showed the band, I think, being one of the metrics they use to try to determine if they need to do a C-section. Mm -hmm. is, is there anything else they would do to determine if they need to do a C-section? Nothing else has passed the FDA. So about 10 years ago, they tried to do fetal pulse oximetry. And uh, it failed its uh, clinical trials. Uh, and pulse oximetry is just, it's not a measure of brain oxygenation. It's uh, peripheral capillary oxygenation. Uh, it's not very well correlated with brain, you know, they don't use it on adults. Uh, and, then, uh, and then recently, actually just in August, ST analysis, which is a more uh, advanced analysis of the fetal heart rate, uh, failed its uh, clinical trials. But again, and that was also invasive. They had a little corkscrew they would screw on the top of the baby's head. Uh, heart rate, heart rate is, is an indirect proxy for brain oxygenation. There are a lot of different variables that affect the heart rate. If you care, care about brain oxygenation, you need to be measuring the amount of oxygen that's in the brain, and this is the only technology that allows you to do that. What are the economics of selling this product, or how, how do you, what's your revenue like selling the product individually to the hospital, or then they own it, or is it leased to them? So we, we're exper uh, experimenting with a bunch of different models, but one possible model is that we would uh, give them the monitor uh, in order to sell them more disposables and increase adoption rate. Uh, you know, this typical in, in medical device industry is, uh, you know, the razor and blades model where you have a thin margin on a capital expenditure and then you have a high margin disposable. You know, in our case, you know, we're looking at a device where the COGS could be a couple thousand dollars. You know, we could, at a very high volume hospital, we could recruit that in a matter of weeks. A, a, a high margin disposable. Any other questions? Oh.
Yeah, so we are uh, very virtual. I am the uh, only full-time employee. I contract out uh, because I want to hire the, I want to use the A team. So we use a contract uh, uh, companies that uh, specialize in doing patient monitoring. They do that as their day job. They do it for Ma uh, Medtronic, Massimo, Space Labs, and uh, that's what I use. Thank you.